So, Berto, I just want to have a fun episode Woo! in which we nerd out about two topics. One, Baldur's Gate 3, a video game, by the way. Ooh. And two, which is which will be the bulk of our conversation, is about Game of Thrones. What do you say? Let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist, and I'm also a professor. My name is Humberto Castaneda. I'm a chlorophyll analyst. So, patron tired scientist from San Francisco, she says, Hi, Kirk and Berto. Can you please talk about Baldur's Gate 3? Hmm. So, by the way, if audience member, dear listener, if you're not into nerd stuff, then I don't know if I would listen to this episode <laughs> unless you just want to bag out, <laughs> <laughs> listen to me and Berto yammer about things you're not interested in and or you're falling asleep because you use it to fall asleep. <sighs> um, so... She says, hi, Kirk Roberto. please talk about Baldur's Gate 3. You reference it a lot, and I want to know your opinions. I'm especially interested to know what Berto thinks about Asterion, given Berto's past traumas. So I don't know exactly what that means, but interesting. what's your answer to that? Well, first of all, I'm traumatized because we haven't finished my campaign. I know. And I realize that's my fault, but... Uh, mm, it is? I thought I thought it was both of our well, fault. Well, I mean, sure, but I, I, I could... I, I'm imagining that if I called you up, I'm like, Kirk, let's play. Often you would say, sure, let's do it. Yeah. 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 I think so. I mean, I, I, I'm sort of out of the habit of yeah. playing games with you the yeah. past five or six months or yeah. something. Yeah. But anyways, I want to finish my campaign yeah. because it was so much fun. Um, I, I like you, was completely blown away by the game. I was not expecting it at all. Yeah. Like I... I, I, you know, I had played games like it, like that along those lines before, but and not having had anywhere near as much D and D experience as you, the bits I had had were actually with you. A lot of the games we've played and stuff, but then when we started playing that game, I really felt like I was playing Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, uh, I, same. I've played dozens of Dungeons and Dragons games and games that are knockoffs yeah. of Dungeons and Dragons and enjoyed them, but. Not like Baldur's Gate 3. No. I have, n especially the first, it's in three different acts, yeah. three different segments that the game is. And the first act by far to me is, masterpiece. is, is a masterpiece. It's so good. It's so much like D&D. You actually make choices. The NPCs react differently to you based on the choices you make. You can truly choose different paths. Crazy dramatic. Like I was just remembering how, Remember the trolls or the the where the trolls or the ogres? Ogres, the ogres, the two ogres. Yeah, two, two or three ogres. We walk in. Three. There's supposed to be a plan. There, we, we could have had a very well formed plan. We could have had like things where okay, we're first gonna knock these columns over and hit them, but I just barged in and aggroed them. And the battle starts, and miraculously we survived. Yeah, and it was so fun to be like, "Wow, okay, that went totally unexpected." Yeah, it's and it's just like D and D in that it, one encounter. Yeah, you might remember for the rest of your life. Yeah, whereas playing Diablo three, right? It's, it's every character's like <laughs> I don't, yeah. I can't remember a single encounter right, right. <laughs> in Diablo. Um, but anyway, what do you think of Asterion? Okay, so... So I for mean, those who don't know, who don't know the game, Asterion is a vampire elf who is the rogue, the right. thief of the group, and he's very flamboyant. He has a dark side, but he also has like a vulnerability to him. Right. There's a, the Asterion character was maybe my favorite because his character had the most nuance and the most... I don't know. There were a lot of interactions that you had at the campsite with Asterion. And well, he's hard to figure out at first because at first you just, at least I felt it was like, oh, I see. He's one of these uppity, richy folk who like, you know, he's too good for school and stuff. But then you start interacting more with him and like, okay, wait a minute. No, there's more to this character. Yeah. And then depending how you play it, he could start falling for you, right? Right. And then well, any could, of the characters will start yeah, falling for exactly. you. Yeah, exactly. Um, now, I'm wondering if this question, do, do you feel like this question might require me knowing the rest of his story? Maybe. Because I don't know all Well, of this, I, 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 I don't think this is a spoiler for you that Asterion's boss is a vampire. Yeah, it's that, that one. Right. Yeah. So you, you met him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and Asterion is harmed yes. and controlled. So I'm abused. interested because they're asking about my experiences and how they relate to that. Well, uh-huh. uh, I was a vampire. <laughs> um, actually, uh, yeah, in a way, that is an interesting thing because, you know, that. You, you were a vampire? Well, what I mean is uh, the analogy that they're making. But, but I, it just, something just occurred to me. There is an interesting parallel between becoming a vampire and, and being abused by someone, you know? Because if you think about it, you know, when you become a vampire, normally you're, you're unaware. Someone comes in the dark and attacks you without your consent. And then they decide whether they want to keep you alive and turn you into one of them. And so in a way... Unless you're Bella. Well, yes, yes, exactly. And that's the... But, but in a way, it's, it's similar to like you're, you're young, you're minding your own business. Someone comes along and abuses you without your consent. And I'm not saying they decide, but the fates decide what happens to you after that, whether you become also an abuser, a vampire. It's, I mean, it's a little heavy-handed. Because, I know, I Because know. everyone who becomes a vampire becomes a, you can't yeah, you can't go back well no but 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 the, but there are vampires that refrain from preying on people and some vampires kill their prey and don't turn them into vampires i know the analogy is broken it's but a little the metaphor is over emphasizing <clears throat> that you're kind of doomed if yeah, if you're yeah. harmed yeah. so uh, but, 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 but 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 yeah, but yeah it yeah, occurs to me that it, yes you know like i i had this damage or have this damage in my head and that makes me behave differently now granted the the barito that you might encounter nowadays if you're role playing along with me in real life uh is a very different barito than the one you would have encountered at 10 years ago 20 years ago you know so, sort of that uh in, in many ways not always but in many ways and so in, yeah in some ways you're exactly the same i, I just want Absolutely. to point that I, Absolutely. I don't know if that is comforting no, no, and it is, because I also don't like to... Th- I have met people, I've had friends or acquaintances that changed so dramatically that we never were able to be friends again. Yeah. And I've always feared that. I'm like, well, I don't want to change... I don't want someone that knew me to be like, who are you? No, no, I, I, I met you when you were like 32 yeah. or something, and there's a lot of, in fact, I would say the majority of who you are is, right. is exactly the same. And yet, I'm sure you would probably agree that um, my behavior around people at parties and intoxication situations is very different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and my level of self-awareness and responsibility and all these things is, is dramatically increased. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so as far as Asterion, yeah, sure. I don't necessarily identify with that character, but I could see how he is operating from a place of hurt a yeah. lot of times. Yeah, and that becomes yeah. a very well played out story at least yeah. in terms of the campaign that i played which yeah. might play out differently for other people but i thought that asterian's story was head and shoulders above the rest some mm. some of the other and there were complaints that some of the other characters didn't even necessarily have a resolution to their mm. story at the end but they they added it on and that was that's just one of the great things about larry and studios who made yeah. Baldur's gate 3 is they would listen to the fans and say, okay, well, uh, we we dropped the ball on that one. Let's 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 figure it out and, right. and add some stuff. Let's get those voice act. The other thing is, is Asterion's voice actor is so good. It is, yeah. I mean, really good. It, 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 every time Asterion starts talking, I'm just like, <laughs> uh, I'm gripped. You know? Oh, and by the way, that was something you and I remarked. How in so many games, RPGs, you kind of just want to skip the dialogue. Yeah. Um, there's some rare exceptions, maybe if you actually need to learn what the heck they're trying to explain to you. But oftentimes it's like, yeah, I get it. I get it. The dragon showed up and attacked your village. I get it. In this game, we were always like glued to the dialogue. Yeah. Well, especially act one. Yeah. But really throughout. Also, they don't bombard you with a bunch no. of cutscenes. They show you things that are relevant to the story. Exactly. And the dialogue you are getting, you have to hear it because you're going to react the way you're going to react. Right, you're interested. Yeah. That What a concept. Yeah. The other question that tired scientists from San Francisco asks is, who are you romancing, Berto? 
Oh, yeah, I was, oh, my gosh. Well, sadly, the one I wanted to romance, I killed right off the bat. Uh, yeah, <laughs> what, who, that's... Um, what is her name? Uh, it's uh, Shadowheart. S- Shadowheart, yeah. There yeah. was this really... Yeah, so, so, yeah, for, for the Baldur's Gate fan or the RPG <laughs> games fans, you have to tell the story. Yes, okay. So, I had started my campaign initially by myself, and... and um. You know, and then you start in the, this wrecked spaceship of sh- sorts, and uh, and I'm going through, and then there is this one character that I'm able to free. The first, I think, the it's first the, one the that first I'm able to free. You come across, yeah. but I ended up, you know, the way I freed them ended up killing them. Well, because you, to say yeah. how? Yeah, yeah, because I. Um, let's see. There was a puddle. I did a thing where, like, I burst something, and there was like a puddle. On the ground of like acid, of acid, yeah. So, and so you did that trying to open up, trying her, to open up her pot. pot. It didn't yeah. work, but right. it left a puddle. Right. And so, when you finally finally did open up the pot, up, up the pot, she she was like, "Thank you Thank for you letting so me out." Much. And it then she stepped out into the puddle. and because because she's first level and also maybe injured from the crash, yes. she insta kill. She, she dies. <laughs> insta kill. So and and like, God oh. bless God bless you for not starting over. You're no. like, like you're like, well, no. I guess because you didn't even know she was no a companion. No, <laughs> you, you were like, well, she, oh, I guess maybe. I tried to save her. Yeah, uh, who knows? Like, ah, oh, damn. But yeah, so so she's the the typical cishet attraction. Oh yeah. So she then w- I saw what she looked like. I was like, oh man. <laughs> so she was she was who I was being romantic with my character but but that's such a basic choice right it is but, basic. but i have to say that i was tempted to go with us with asterion because he was so good at flirting <laughs> yeah yeah but berto who did you ultimately end up well with? so i was heavily approached by the um uh what's the the gal the the warrior gal the yeah the the, the um tiefling, tiefling i can't remember i can't remember. no not the Wait, is it the thing? Oh no, Lazel. Lazel. Lazel, yeah. yeah Lazel yeah, yeah. was like heavily, heavily on to me. Well, and I had I to be you like, were, did you turn her down ultimately? Yeah, multiple times, yes. Okay. And she got very upset by it. But I, the one I want, then now the one I'm trying to go for is the Carlac. The Carlac. Yeah, Carlac. The the tiefling barbarian. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. where I'm I'm angling in that direction. Yeah, I mean, if you're playing a a, a het guy and you're trying to look for a lady you have kind of playing a captain kirk you know it's i'll, I'll take the aliens but you, know. <laughs> you have carlac you have well how come you were turning down lazelle she was just uh, i was afraid she would break me in half you know <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Shadowheart, and then you have then thera who i don't think is in your party yet yeah. and then jahara is is way later so yeah i you know okay since you killed Shadowheart, <laughs> since I killed Shadowheart, yeah. I mean, Asterion, he's you know he he seems like he'd treat you treat you well, treat me nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question she has is: Is romance in video games weird to you or fun for you? My partner and I have used this game as a jumping off point to talk about our sexualities a lot, and it's been good for us as a couple. Berto. Well, first of all, my mind was blown when I was a kid and I played Leisure Suit Larry. Uh, it was a text-based adventure game where you could find love in all the wrong places. Uh, I think that was literally the catchphrase. Um, but, you know, there was this sequence where you could have uh, sex with a prostitute if you played your cards right and you had to get like a prophylactic, which I didn't know what it meant at the time. Was your brother looking over your shoulder? As no, you this was not with my brother. He was too little. This was in Colombia, yeah. yeah. But uh, it was it was just a mind opening, like what this like. How did you get this games? game? A friend of mine had a PC, and he had uh, this, and he had Police Quest, and he had Space Quest. And, yeah, yeah. This yeah. game was a phenomenon because maybe there were other games like this that were made for adults that had yeah. sexual themes and and role playing, but this was <laughs> the only one that I had ever heard of, yeah. and I. I didn't know anyone that had it. It was sort of legendary. And it was mind-blowing because you you had a wallet. You could like get in a car. You could go take a, ta- a cab. You could go to the drugstore and buy stuff. Like It was mind-blowing you know, at the time. Yeah. There, there was and like, it was based freedom. On, <laughs> it was based on you're playing Leisure Suit Larry, who is kind of a creeper 
who's he's a white linen suit goes out into the town to the dance but, clubs and but he's not considered to be a charismatic no he he's he's trying to live up yeah to a standard i but you know i have to say i don't think i ever wanted to play that game like was it a fun game yeah it was because you i don't know again it was so novel it's like yeah I, do you remember Duke Nukem 3D when it came out? Like, did yeah. you? I never played those. Playing, I never uh, played those games. Well, everyone was playing Doom, which of course is great. But when Duke Nukem 3D came out, it was a, another mind blowing thing because you're sitting there and you're playing in a theater. Like, uh, you, you go in, and there's a theater and there's the screen and there's where the projector room is and there's bathrooms and you can go to the bathroom and see the mirror reflection of yourself. It was it was like awesome because it felt. Like oh oh yeah you could make a video game with this stuff in it you yeah, know yeah yeah um and the the weapons also were really cool so that's the kind of feeling I had when I was playing Leisure Suit Larry that I was like what I could do these things in a video game yeah 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 well so for me with Baldur's Gate three I certainly liked some of the romance stuff but once my relationship my character's relationship with Shadowheart got going it lost a lot of steam there was there's a middle point in the storyline of the romance where you're basically communicating to each other in the in this very familiar way and shadowheart will say oh i just think you're the best or stuff stuff like that <laughs> and it, it it got really repetitive because i think the script was that they didn't want you to progress in your relationship until later or something. Oh, okay. And so there's kind of like this dead zone. It seems to it seems to ramp up real fast. And uh -huh. the other thing is, is once it hit that plateau, I just wasn't particularly interested in in the role playing uh, aspects of it. Okay. Because all your interactions are happening at the camp, and you're looking up at the stars, right. and you're talking about. So let, let me get this straight. So it starts hot and heavy, and then you kind of get more into it, and then you have sex, and then you lose interest. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 the sex part, if I remember right, was much later on. But they get real. You're naked, you know, yeah, yeah. and, and it, you're, you're doing stuff. But anyway, um, uh, I didn't really need it. If it didn't have it, I would have been fine. There were so many other more right. rich aspects of role playing. Um, so there's that. Um, also, I guess I was kind of hoping that the role, the, the role played romance would have something more central to the mm. storyline, you know? Right. But, but I'm guessing that would be hard to do because of all the companions and what if you don't want to be with anyone sure. and, and, yeah. and maybe there was, and I just didn't, toggle that storyline switch or something. But what I really did like about Baldur's Gate 3 is that they handle gender and sexuality better than any other game I've ever sure. played by far. Yeah. <laughs> they uh, played it so that, and you know, other games have done this too, but the way that they did it, it just came off like they'd been doing this for De for decades yeah. yeah it wasn't called attention to but it was right there yeah the sheer fact that as a cishet guy myself as asterian is hitting on me and the way that it's going i'm like considering it you right. know and and role playing through it whereas i think other writers and directors voice actors it would seem more creepy forced or, or, or forced yeah, yeah. or look how pansexual yeah, we are exactly. you know what i mean like it just didn't have any of that but but it, but it was right. right there you could dial in your exact uh, penis size and, right <laughs> and your your labia size you know what i mean like you could get real micro very very micro <laughs> um but I, I i really i really uh, uh loved the way that they did it it really truly felt like you could play whatever uh, yeah. whatever gender and whatever sexuality you wanted to play. And it also gave you a chance to act that out. You know, like if right. you were playing another game, it could say, hey, you know, toggle or, or check what sexuality you are. Right. But it didn't have any bearing. It, it didn't feel like, you know, say you wanted to be a non-binary pansexual person. Yeah. Uh, the storyline just wouldn't allow you to enact it that. Didn't whereas, whereas this pull you into a thing. You could just play how you wanted to play at yeah. any given moment. Whereas yeah. this game actually had role played right. aspects that 
weren't like explicitly gender or sexuality, but right. you could feel like you're enacting your own or your character. Maybe you wanted to play right. a cishet character or something, and you wanted to go down that road for yourself. Yeah. So do you know of other games? We don't know all, all the games in the... I'm sure there's been, but not 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 like this. You're right, that, that I've played, no. Um, I will say, I loved my romance in our campaign where my uh, half-orc... Uh, uh, ended up falling for for this other half orc. What was her name? Um, uh, so you were Grolo. He- Grolo and and uh, was it Hetty or yeah or uh, something man. like that? I wish we wish we could remember. I really fell for her. <laughs> yeah, that was real, man. That was it real, was so nice. and it was organic too. Yeah, like it, exactly. it kind of came out of nowhere. <laughs> uh, all right, let's take a break. We get back. Let's get into Game of Thrones. What do you say? Let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. Let's do an OPP, Birdo. OPP. These people became patrons all the way back in 2017. They've been patrons for seven wow. freaking years, and they've stayed patrons the entire time. These people did not list where they're from, so we can't send them any sort of swag, but that's okay. We have Bonnie from God Knows Where. We have Amanda, Daniel, who I pretty sure I've communicated with Holly, Marianne, Yang, Felix, Anna, Idun, Melinda, Frida, Rob, Michael, L, and Nick. Thank you wow. so much for becoming a patron all the way back in 2017 and staying a patron. All right, Game of Thrones. So I was texting with Colin. I was telling you about this earlier yeah. today. I was texting with Colin. If people don't know him, he comes on the podcast sometimes and talks about movies and other kinds of stuff. He's he's really smart about that. And he just randomly texts me this one day. I think I was still in bed. It was in the morning. And he says, who do you, you know, give me a list of, of your rankings regarding who played the Game of Thrones the best. Ah, yes. Of all the characters. And so I went back and forth with him for a little bit, asking like, well, what do you, what's the criteria? Da, da. <laughs> and he said that the criteria are effectiveness of strategy, implementation of power, and use of resources. And he also clarified that it's the show, not the books, right. and it's up until the end of season four. Oh, okay, good, good. Oh, but then, because I was going to put little finger near the top. Well, let's see. So he gave he gave his list. He said his number one was Marjorie T- Terrell. Why can't, can we go to season six? Okay, fine. Uh, well, you could okay. you, you, if you wanted to. Um, Marjorie Terrell, really? And then we have, so we're going to get into it. So then we have Olena, and then Littlefinger. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Then Tywin, yeah. who is dead by the end of season yeah. four, by the way. Varys, Tyrion... Catelyn Stark, who was dead in the show by that point. In the books, um, yeah. it's unclear. But So apparently dying, you're not graded down for dying. <laughs> what? Uh, which which I think to be a little suspect. But, yeah. But that, that seems like <laughs> with, with the time you had, were you? But I didn't use that. I, I yeah. said if you got killed... That's a big down mark. Then you're not... You did not win the Game of Thrones. This is why I was... I Like to me, Littlefinger is one of the best. Except he did end up getting offed, yeah. but he got off at a weird time in the season. He got off so. like season seven. Yeah. Plus, I- I'm pretty sure all that stuff is is yeah. not going to play out in the books. So we have uh, Catelyn Stark, and then we have Cersei Lannister, then Stannis, and then Bronn. Yeah, and then he says, "Do you agree?" So I'm sitting there, uh, look, I'm staring at my phone. You know, I'm, I'm looking it over, and I have all these thoughts. And then I went down a rabbit hole, Berto. <laughs> And uh, so let, let's get into it. Well, first off, off the top of your head, without going down the rabbit hole that I did, who who would be your at the top of your list? Yeah, at top of my list would be Littlefinger. Uh, not necessarily number one, but like top three would be Littlefinger, Cersei, and Daenerys. Daenerys. Yeah. Right. So my list is Littlefinger number one, Daenerys number two, Olena number three, Marjorie number four, and Cersei number five. So tell me a little bit about Marjorie and Elena. So uh, let's get into it. Um, let's first talk about Littlefinger. Okay, sure. we're, You yeah. and I are agreeing yeah, n- yeah. number one. Yeah. And it actually took me a while to put him at number one, but when I really thought about it and wrote out <laughs> what he has accomplished oh, yeah. and 
possibly and where he's set up to go. Yeah. Now, you know, in the show, we know that he's killed, yeah. but there's a chance that uh, he won't be. But he's killed kind of in a dumb way in the show. Yeah, a lot of people yeah. didn't like that. I, You know, I, I was forgiving of the show because... I knew that he wouldn't have fallen for that, anyways. But yeah, I'm accept accepting out that because, like, starting from the beginning, he's manipulating so many things, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, and he he manipulated so many things to get to the point at the beginning. You know, yeah, where he was one, at the start. One. Yeah. So if we start at the beginning of his life, he was born into a very minor house in the Vale, mm -hmm. like a, a completely unforgettable house. In the fingers, or a forgettable, yeah, yeah. A, a very forgettable yeah. house. So that's happened. Then he falls in love with Catelyn Tully. Right. Uh, she's not married to a Stark yet, and Catelyn rejected him. Mm -hmm. And he's not strong. He's not rich. He's not famous. <laughs> he doesn't have prestige. He's not the heir to some mm -mm. awesome house. But he managed. There's a lot of details here, but he managed. He manages to worm his way into John Aaron's circle, mm. so he's the hand who was killed where where Ned right, replaced right. you know? So he worms his way into John Aaron's circle, which is a big deal. You know, John sure. Aaron is Lord of the Vale. That's that's a huge uh, leap just from where he's at, right? And John Aaron became very impressed by Peter Baelish's intelligence and his yeah. go gettedness and his savvy. So right there, even if he just ended there that's huge i would give a grade of an a plus just right. for that then when john became hand of the king after the war between you know between robert and and the mad king um when john became hand of, hand of the king john made little finger master of coin right and you just gotta know <laughs> that little finger figured out a way <laughs> to make that choice seem very natural for John Aaron. <laughs> That's right. Because John Aaron is hand of the fucking king. <laughs> he can make anyone master of coin. Yeah, yeah. There was already a master of coin in all likelihood. I don't know who yeah, the Targaryens yeah. had, but That's a huge coup right there. Yeah. Master of coin. None, yeah. Master no of less. coin. <laughs> one. Two, you're on the king's council. That's right. You're on the you're on a short list of the most powerful people so again in if, even if you stop there yeah that's that's <laughs> another a plus <clears throat> then little finger seduces lisa aaron mm -hmm. who loved him as a kid so he could in all likely we don't know exactly why he's doing these things but seemingly so he could get influence for, to the veil at the time she's married to the hand of the king lisa lisa aaron and yet he manages to weasel his way into her life, and she's completely infatuated with him. I mean, I think part of it is Lysa Aaron had some issues, but at the same time, he manages. And maybe that's part of the genius, is that he managed to manage Lysa Aaron and right. her weirdness without it blowing up in his face sure, in, sure. in King's Landing. So that's a big deal. Then he kills John Aaron, by the way, <laughs> uh, which I mean that's huge. <laughs> yeah, manages to manages to poison him and manages to get allies to play a part in the poisoning of him, including Lysa gets yeah. Lysa Aaron to kill her husband. It's crazy. Yeah, uh, it, it, yeah, and he, he does this presumably because chaos is a ladder, and if John Aaron dies, then. There's a little bit more chaos, a little bit more ability to right. maneuver. And John Aaron was uh, reportedly a very, uh, you know, uh, had a lot of honor and integrity and probably didn't suffer fools like Littlefinger very much. So yeah. getting rid of John Aaron would give him more, more maneuverability. But then Ned Stark becomes hand to the king, which could have been predicted, I suppose, sure. if anyone would have thought about it it's like well who would robert choose if john aaron's right. dead um he's not going to choose mace terrell mm -hmm. or one of the uh uh one of the people from dorn um so uh maybe you would think uh tywin but uh, i think pretty much anyone on the inner circle knew that yeah. tywin and robert didn't get along all that well but anyway so this is maybe little fingers uh, first, at least noticeable misstep, because John Aaron, uh, as Hand, 
would have been more manipulatable through Lysa Aaron. Mm-hmm. But when Ned comes in, it's like he's incorruptible. Right. <laughs> and that you're not going to, and you're certainly not going to get to Ned through Catelyn. So, but it's okay because he's got a plan for that too. <laughs> so then um, Ned starts to investigate the same thing that John Aaron is investigating, finds out that the Lannister, the, uh, you know, the heir to the throne right. is not a Baratheon and there's movements to get Ned arrested and he helps to get Ned arrested and he aligns uh, himself with the Lannisters very clearly potentially, you know, definitely against the Starks, but also kind of against the king in a certain way. He gets the gold cloaks on his side, which is a pretty big deal because the hand and the gold cloaks go hand yeah. in hand. But for the master of coin to come along and get the the gold cloaks to, to follow and, him. And meanwhile, he's lying to Catherine, right? To Catelyn? To Catelyn. Uh, probably. Why? Is any, was any, if I remember right, he was trying to make it seem like he was trying to help Ned, right? Yes. Yeah. And he also, right, exactly. Yeah. Both. Ned, he got Ned to actually kind of like him. Right, and, right, and right. trust him. Yeah. Yeah. So then, and there's a lot of other details here, but just kind of going over the highlights. He worms his way into the good graces with the Lannisters, and they make him Lord of Harrenhal at that mm-hmm. point. Now, Harrenhal isn't such a great place to be Lord of, but he is no longer just... A simple, a essential farm boy yeah. who just happens to be master of corn. Now he's a lord, uh, you know, someone who owns land right. and has the biggest castle. It's it's halfway uh, burned down, but you know, <laughs> it is still the biggest castle, yeah. and and this makes him a, leg- a legit lord and possible uh, makes it possible for him to marry other uh, right. you know influential people. Littlefinger marries Ly- Lysa Aaron. And he proceeds to murder her, <laughs> which makes Littlefinger stepfather and, you know, essentially the keeper of Lord Robin, Aaron. This essentially means that Peter Baelish is Lord of the Vale. Now. Yeah. Robin's very young and uh, not very bright. <laughs> and also, the Vale has one of the strongest armies anyway, but the army of the Vale and the Knights of the Vale have been basically untouched mm-hmm. throughout all this. So all their numbers are strong and they're ready to go. So very quickly, he's now Lord of Hall, essentially right. Lord of the Vale, yeah. has the, the one of the best armies at his fingertips and a highly defendable region of the Vale. You know right. what I mean? It's in, impenetrable. So then he manipulates Sansa to be dependent on him. And Sansa is essentially the heir to the north, right? Because they don't know about the others, because they and that manipulation they depict it so well. It's he gets his little nasty claws in her brain. It's so horrible. Yeah, and it spans <laughs> a number of seasons. Yeah, and he could potentially marry Sansa, right? Which would kind of make sense, and he could uh, acquire the north, or at the very least, be extremely influential over right. the north, right? So. From there, he would have Heron Hall and presumably the Freys right. and the North and the Vale. He's like, <laughs> he's Lord of yeah. almost half the realm. So powerful. And he could use his powers to get rid of Olena and Marjorie and Cersei and maybe yeah. maybe even Danny because Danny's good, but she doesn't have a little finger in her, no, in her right. corner. And then when I thought about it, about what how, how he could be poised to be king... He just needs to wait for Ramsay and Stannis to cull their numbers because at the end, you know, it, it, of season four, they're from my memory, they're about to fight in yeah. the north, and Stannis's army is dying in the winter, and Ramsay doesn't have that many people. Plus, it's hard to imagine Ramsay being a very effective leader mm-hmm. of of humans yeah. uh, outside of war, you know. I mean, certainly he'd be terrifying, but he could make a lot of enemies. Plus, he's a bastard who becomes yeah. a Bolton anyway. And listeners out there, if you can tell, I think a lot about Game of Thrones. Um, <laughs> well, and there was a there was a time when the show was active that many of us, even though I hadn't read the books, like I was obsessed by what was happening and what was going to happen. You yeah. Know? Well, I I just think about this all the time. <laughs> anyway, um, he could have a child with Sansa, right. and that child could be made heir of the Vale behind 
Robin, and then he could kill Robin, yeah. and then his child could be heir to the because right. you know, um, and then uh, he could make a deal with Dorne, maybe even promise to let them be free again, right? Uh, and then he so he could get Dorne on his side, and so then he would just have the Lannisters and the T- Tyrells to deal with, which is you know quite a a, a force. But given Littlefinger's ability to manipulate and assassinate people and get allies. Yeah. And uh, he was still young. So, I mean, he yeah. had the time. Yeah. Um, at the end of season four, Tywin Lannister is dead. Right. So that's the other thing is he's not contending with the, the, the lion. No. Uh, he's contending with uh, uh, Cersei. Uh, Tyrion is across the narrow he's sea. He's not anywhere to be seen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and also, Mace Terrell is very weak. Yeah, Olena is smart, but I don't. But she doesn't, you know, lead at the yeah. uh, the armies at the front. So the overall grade for uh, Littlefinger is an astronomical A plus. Yeah. All right. So uh, agreed. <laughs> let's take a break. We get back. Let's go on to Daenerys. Let's do it. All right, we're back from the break. So I just want to do a little business here, Birdo. All right. So we have our 16th anniversary live show coming up on, on September 14 and 15. Oh, my goodness. Also, I want to promote Birdo's cameo. Uh, so when someone asks you to give a cameo on cameo, uh, what's your process? Oh, dude, I go all, all out. Like, um, you know, because they've, they've asked me to do like a birthday greeting or help someone feel better about some really bad situations and things. So um, often what I do is I'll write a little song for them and then I'll play it on guitar or at least I'll sing it or something. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I put on a little show, man. Okay. We also have Birdo merch that is coming out. We have actually three new merch items that Stacy and I have worked really hard on developing. We also got a lot of suggestions from the audience, but I, I, I love all th- three of these. I, you know, we developed these, Stacy and I, and we were like, well, which one do we pick? And I was like, fuck it, let's just do all three. Yeah. Um, we again have our 16th anniversary live show. We'll be live streaming for eight hours each day, September 14, 15, in the year 2024, depending on when you're listening to this. So if you want to send in your cards, your postcards, your packages, your your f- uh, fan art, you can send it to the address that is listed on our website on the on the homepage at, at the bottom. And we love fan art. And oh, yeah. if you make fan art, if you can, include yourself, the co-hosts, other kinds of elements. I always love seeing that. Also, our next deep dive is going to be Elon Musk. So mm-hmm. watch out for that. But we're trying to take a break from heavy stuff for a bit. Uh, that's why we're doing this episode. All right, Daenerys. So so your Daenerys. list, it's interesting that for Colin, Daenerys isn't even on the list. Yeah. Um, and he had Littlefinger at number three behind Marjorie and Olena, which we'll get to in a second. But um, where was Danny on your list? Well, so I didn't necessarily list him in order, but I said, uh, the order I said was... Uh, Littlefinger. Littlefinger... Uh, Cersei Daenerys. So who? It, so you think Cersei's number two? Yeah, I still think so. Why um, do you think? So let's go to Cersei. Yeah. Why do you put Cersei number two? Okay. So to me, some of these are not fair because, like, on the one hand, Littlefinger's the amount of long range planning and the rise and to power, rise and deviousness is so monumental. So it's kind of unfair to compare it to some other folk. But what I have to say is like. It would have been quite easy for Cersei to get overpowered, meaning she she was in a situation where it would have been very easy for her to lose control and just get bullied out of out of the running, right? And even though you know she's despicable in so many ways, like I have to give her her Game of Thrones credit that even in spite of the religious zealots and even in spite of all the attacks and everything, she managed, she managed to stay in the running to the very, very end. Yeah, well, you're going beyond season. Sure, sure. But, but I guess I mean, well, yeah, that's fine. But I, I, guess, I guess I mean like she never broke character. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, she, I mean, if you go by results, yeah, then... Cersei is, you know, if you include post 
season four was a very good player in the Game of Thrones. Yeah. But let me make a case for her. You know, I, I have her at number five. Yeah. Behind Littlefinger, Danny, Olena, and Marjorie. And let me make a case, especially if we only consider where she was at sure. at the end of season four. I'm sure you'll be able to convince me based on that timeline. Right. So, um, and when I went over these details today, I was actually surprised because in my head, Cersei is cunning and ruthless and successful. But when you actually look at the choices that she made, and also I'm mainly focusing on book stuff, which overlaps a lot with the show, but some things don't. But anyway, so um, she uh, becomes, at the end of season four, queen regent for her young son, young son, King Tommen. So if we look at that, it's like, well, that's a big deal, right? Because in some ways, especially since Tommen isn't married, she is essentially the ruler of the realm yeah. because Tywin's dead. So she is essentially the ruler. But you have to ask yourself, how did she end up there? Because if she was randomly placed there, <laughs> then she's not playing a game. She just got bat around by other players of the game, you know? So let's see where she is in that spectrum. So if we go back to the beginning, as a young woman, she's very ambitious. From a young age, she would talk about how she didn't understand why uh, she couldn't play the Game of Thrones the way that her brother Jamie could, mm -hmm. because they were... The, the whole thing in the books is they look identical. Even as adults, mm. they look apparently the same, mm. <laughs> that the... the the actors don't look the same, but in real life, or in real life, in the books... Were they twins? Like, Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but not, you know... Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the there's a lot of lines and a lot of words given to that emphasis that if you just put a wig on <laughs> on Jamie, he would look like, like Cersei. Whoa. And uh, she was very upset about this. She's like, my brother, you know, he looks like we, we look the same. Yeah. I actually have more ambition. And she thought of herself as smarter, yeah. even though she probably wasn't. And she would say, you know, I don't understand why I can't be ruler. This is bullshit. I, I have to be just married off, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. So she had a lot of ambition. So that's she's not someone that's just waiting for things to happen. And she was desperate to marry Prince Rhaegar, the right. son, the heir to the throne, King Aerys' son, and uh, Tywin, her father, really wanted her to marry Prince Rhaegar too, because once that would Prince, consolidate the right. yeah. But the Mad King refused because he was pissed off at Tywin at the time. Long story. Um, and after Robert won the war, Tywin Tywin somewhat forced his daughter Cersei to marry Robert, who had killed Prince Rhaegar. So at this point, she's queen, but she kind of reluctantly married Robert. On one hand, she wanted to marry Robert because then she'd finally be able to be queen. Right. But she didn't like Robert. She didn't really know him that well. And also, Robert was a brute. And Robert killed Rhaegar. <laughs> she, uh, on one hand, she wanted to marry Prince Rhaegar just because she wanted to be queen. But on the other hand, she, she really had a romantic vision of Prince Rhaegar. Prince Rhaegar... Uh, do you know much about his details? No. He is just, he's the consummate prince. Okay. He is gallant and beautiful and smart and charismatic. This isn't the Mad King. This, this is, is the, the Mad King's son. Son, yeah. And there is a lot of evidence that his son eventually came to the conclusion that his dad had to go. Uh. And he might have actually conspired with all the nobles to kill his dad Man. so it could fast track him into the into the throne but then and, he got got too <laughs> yeah i mean there's a whole thing there. there's a whole like uh, what if kind of storyline yeah. but but anyway so cersei uh, starts off not really liking robert his personality the fact he killed prince rhaegar and also uh once they get married she learns that robert is a horrible husband and that's not really portrayed in the in the show very much but you know, Robert was abusive. Well, but they, so me not having read anything, even in that very first episode or episodes, 
as soon as they introduce them, it, it, they make it painfully obvious that she's not a happy yeah. <laughs> wife. Um, not to mention that she's having an affair with her brother, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was a window there where she might have given up her love with Jamie because they had a relationship since they were very young. Yeah. And she might have been convinced or wooed by Robert, at the very least, to have sex and have kids so they could have legitimate right. offspring. <laughs> Let him, yeah. But Robert was drinking all the time. and But the other thing is, is Robert didn't want to be with her. Mm-hmm. He wanted to be with Ned's sister, mm-hmm. <laughs> who died, who Prince Rhaegar, everyone believed, raped, but she actually, they actually ran off together. Anyway, and that was... Yeah, know, that was that other storyline. It's yes. John, <laughs> John Snow's parents. Yeah. According to the show, we don't know if that's going to be the book, but that makes it's probably going to be that anyway. So at this point, what what grade do we give Cersei? Well, in sure. terms of the Game of Thrones, sure, not much, but 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 after you know after this, she but starts... no, just as just just as far, yeah, not much, yeah, no, uh, low, like low because whether she wanted to marry uh, the the king, whether Rhaegar or yeah. Robert, was irrelevant because Tywin would have made her do it anyway. So. Yes. And maybe she could have convinced Robert to settle down. Probably not. So, so she's a victim of circumstance at this point. Yeah. So, so she's whatever game she's playing, uh, no one's listening. So, the next thing is that she has three children with her twin brother, and she has zero children with Robert. Hmm. Now, having her turn to Jamie it is understandable because they were very close and had a romantic sexual relationship. (laughs) But she did have sex with Robert, and from my memory would have moon tea to make sure she would never have Robert's kid because she hated him so much. Yeah. What's her grade now? Well, now now she's playing the game. Okay. Because, first of all, I mean, think about the... Now is what I'm saying. She doesn't break character. Think of the commitment. She's like, all right... Let's see. I'm going to, at the risk of myself and everyone around me, I'm going to have kids with my brother well, and pass them off as Robert's kids. It's ballsy, but is it a good move? It's insane. <laughs> yeah, but it, it, it's insane, but it's not a good move. If she wanted to secure her power, having legitimate children with Robert would be the road, but she's being emotional about it. Yes, no no question about it. But at the same time, she I think she's seen it like, well, I want power, but I want power from my bloodline with Jamie. But it would be, so when we get to it, it it's so easily detected. And also, uh, she was, you know, with Jamie, if she is seen by anyone loyal to Robert, she's dead. This is where, but see, this is why I give her marks, because you and I would analyze in the moment if, She's like, hey, I have a question for you guys. You guys are my advisors. What do you think of this plan? I'm going to have sex with my brother, which I do. Don't don't get alarmed. I already do that. But I'm going to have three kids with them, pretend they're Roberts, and then not have any kids with Robert and stuff. What do you guys think? We'd be like, you're crazy. You're insane. What are you trying to do? That's never going to work, first of all. And then now, after she has us killed and proceeds with her plan anyway... And is somehow successful. Well, but, but she doesn't know that at that point. And I know. the chance of her being successful is... Very, plus, what's the game? Because if Joffrey yeah. turned out not to be such a psychopath, yeah. he thinks of himself as a Baratheon. Yeah. And he will marry... He will be King Joffrey Baratheon. He will marry uh, Marjorie Terrell. No one will know that Cersei pulled a fast one on Robert... Because if they did, he would not be king or he would be overthrown. But remember so, that she was still, she at no point was trying to pretend that they weren't Robert's kids. Huh? So as far as she was concerned, it's like, I don't think she cares. She's like, yeah, it's fine. They'll think what they'll think. But it, I'll still know they're No, no, she was kids. adamant that they were Robert's kids. I, that's Every, what I'm saying. Everything depended on that's people what I'm saying. believing. Yeah. So in other words, she, I don't so think So what she, game, what, what's... She's, she's still she, in power. She's still in power as much as she can be because she's not... She can't be elected But king, if she's right? trying but, to be in power yeah. and she's trying... Or at the very least, retain yeah. her power that she currently has, what she is doing is every time she's with Jamie... And every day that goes by that those kids are around, she is at she's a hair width away <laughs> sure. from losing not only power but her life, maybe her entire house. Sure. The Lannisters, sure. if Robert had found out, sure. which we'll get to. So anyway, so no, I th- no, that's true. That's extremely so, reckless. Like, would would Littlefinger allow 
Now, might you say, Cersei, you go, girl, or that's badass? Okay, but that's not the Game of Thrones. No, if- no, I, I, I wouldn't look at it like that. But I would, I would look at it like what's odd is what's more likely to be successful for her might, in fact, not be to have kids with Robert, which is it's weird and reckless and chaotic. But in her mind, she's thinking about it like this is the only path forward. But I can't have kids with him. But since, but since this is based on medieval history, yeah. As with King Henry VIII, if you as the queen cannot bear an heir to the king, then talk will be had right. around offing you. But so that's that, why she gave him three kids. But I'm just saying, it's <laughs> yeah. like, uh, yeah. now, you know, you can make your own choice about whether or not yeah. you think Cersei was justified or a badass or whatever. But in terms of the Game of Thrones, it would have been smarter for her to... Uh, like a, a fast track to power would be she has legitimate dark haired kids with Robert. Yeah. Then she kills Robert and then is queen regent over a legitimate son with, that has no uh, question marks around him. Yeah. Um, and uh, proceeds that way, but she didn't even do that. You know, she, yeah. she never uh, uh, apparently, at least in terms of the book, there's no evidence she never tried to get Robert killed uh, until much later. So the whole time, she's just risking everything, not only herself, risking the life of Jamie, risking the life of her three kids who she cared about, risking the life of Tywin, risking the entire Lannister line because her emotions, you know, that that's Littlefinger would never do that, right? That's okay. fair. So the next thing is that she is a queen with Robert for a number of years, like 20 years or how many years? A long time. Uh, and during that time, she's not very influential because Robert doesn't really let her be influential. But well, it can't be twenty years, right? or like because their kids weren't that old, right? It's like fifteen yeah. or something, like so, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, she is not very influential, and she doesn't appear to be trying to gain influence. Really, maybe she would have been unsuccessful anyway, but she's basically a, a marginal character during during those years. But you could also argue, yes, but you could also argue that as far as she's seen it, the risk time period has passed. No one killed her over the first kid. No one killed her over the second kid. Kid, The, the main kid who's now going to be the, the inheritor of the throne is now getting of age and no one's... I mean, there's rumors, but, you know... But I'm just saying, what would Peter... What, WWPBD, <laughs> he would kill Robert a long time ago because the longer Robert is alive, the longer it's a possibility that he'll find out and kill the entire Lannister line. But you got to think of it, that's thinking of it from the perspective of a guy, though. She's a woman in a man's world, and right now Robert's in in charge of the whole thing and she's his, she's the wife so she's got a lot of power even though she's not the one in charge or go to tywin her father and yeah. say here's the deal we got to do something let's do something but, but she, he's but, but, but she, he's a very rational dude and he'd probably be like mm, that's chaos i yeah. don't like it i'm just saying that in terms of the game of thrones yeah she just happened to be born into a family perfectly positioned to yes. be uh, uh, uh and she's the only daughter so she would be the queen and she is risking everything for her love of jamie and her anger at robert but you could also this is fair but i could also make an argument that for 15 years she's role played her role with robert apparently to perfection because she's alive and well and still the queen of the realm yeah i mean <laughs> she, she uh is still alive. So, so you that- could say like for someone who she hates for having an affair with her brother, three kids with her brother, and she's still alive and well, 15 years later in charge of the, that's pl- something's going right for her. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe one way of saying it's like, she's allowed herself to have her feelings and her cake and eat it too. Yeah. And that's a success story. Okay. okay. So then the hand of the King, John Aaron starts to figure out, that the kids are not Robert's. <laughs> it's like, take a look, guys. Come on now. <laughs> yeah. And, and Cersei and Jamie knew that John Aaron was investigating, and they also were suspecting that John Aaron found out. Because why would he be looking into this? And it wouldn't be that hard to look right. into it. And so at this point, Cersei and Jamie are 
in all like this isn't depicted in the book. It's before the books begin, but in all likelihood, Cersei and Jaime are like, "What do we do?" Right. So, what do you think Cersei did? Um. So, she probably started having conversations with people like Littlefinger and others to plant seeds for that guy's demise. <laughs> That would be the smart move. Yeah. She didn't do that. Oh, okay. What else do you think? If she were playing the Game of Thrones, what would she do? Um, she would try to frame him in some way. Yeah. Or yeah. kill him some. Or just have do him something. Kill, yeah. Uh, she didn't do anything. She didn't, she didn't take a single action. She just was upset and worried. Okay. She didn't do anything. Where is that? Is that in the book? Yes. Okay. Well, it's heavily implied because we hear Cersei's point of view and this is all from memory in the books, okay. that she asks herself certain questions in her mind that indicate that she had nothing to do with mm. John Aaron's death and didn't know who did it. Okay. Um, but Littlefinger got Lysa Aaron to kill John. We've already been over yeah. that. And Cersei just randomly benefited from that. Did she, or was she like... I could do something, but it seems like the fates are against him anyways. <laughs> that's that's a very bad choice because Littlefinger killing John Aaron, especially in that moment, is actually a little against what you would think Littlefinger would do. Because if yeah. if John if he if chaos yeah. is a ladder, there's nothing more chaotic than John Aaron, the hand of the king, telling the king, by the way, your yeah. kids are not yours. There would be probably a war between Tywin and, and Robert. Yeah. And there would be a fair amount of chaos. So then we fast forward. Now Ned is Hand of the King, right? Who's even worse than John Aaron yeah. as a pain in the ass to someone like Cersei and Littlefinger, by the way. But now Cersei starts taking an active role in Ned's demise. Uh, uh, right? Uh, no, uh, Robert's demise. So um, it seems that's the thing. Yeah. It's like when I start, when I think about Cersei, I think, my God, what a genius! But when you go line by line, uh -huh. even in the show, uh -huh. you're like, oh. She just lucked out. So, uh, but what she does take action. So at this point, she does have Robert killed, right? Right. Yeah. Well, but here's or the plot. Directly, at least. Do, do you remember? No. So I mean, there's a hunting. They go on a hunting trip. Yeah. And then he gets shot. Or no, no. Um, there's a a hunt for a wild boar. Yeah. And Cersei knows that he's about to go, and the king's squire or servant or helper is Lancel Lannister. Right. Who, in the books anyway, maybe in the show, Cersei and Lan Lancel are having an affair as well. Cersei gets Lancel, who is his wine bearer, mm. to put much stronger wine right. in the, you know, in the bottle or in yeah. the container to make Robert be particularly drunk. Yeah. Now, it ends up working because... As he's attacking the boar, the boar, the boar kills him. Or the boar, well, the boar guts him yeah. and doesn't kill him, but he has a, a mortal uh, wound okay. that you know is yeah. infected. But that is not an you know if someone came, if Cersei came to me, it's like okay, I want Robert dead. Yeah, um, because I've got a surefire way. We'll get him drunk. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, Ned. But she needs plausible deniability. Okay, but <laughs> Ned could have also gone with him on the hunt, yeah, and said Robert by the or he could have sent a messenger. Sure. The the what Cersei could not have known is that Ned would be so stupid because <laughs> because this is a yeah, yeah. very hotly debated thing. Ned could have told King Robert uh, at the very least when Robert comes back to the castle to King's Landing, he's dying but he's not dead and this yeah. is depicted in the show ned goes in to have a private conference with him and all ned has to do is tell him and robert would say okay wow i mean it would be a tough thing maybe robert denies it or something but if robert believes ned which we could imagine then they're all dead the lannisters yeah. are all dead yeah. now robert and ned would have to shore up a lot of allies because yeah, yeah. if there's a war and Robert is dying, then there's got to... But instead, doesn't Ned go to Cersei and confront her or something? Well, so Ned goes to Cersei yeah. and confronts her and says, Ugh. you need to leave. Oh, my gosh. Because Robert's going to kill you. Monumentally stupid. Then Robert comes back and he's on his deathbed. The very So the very next scene, the very next moment that Ned has with Robert is 
on his deathbed, he's still fully conscious. He's yeah. not like drifting in and out of consciousness. He has his kingly faculties. <sighs> Cersei did nothing to try to prevent Ned. She should have tried to kill Ned. Uh, she should have done everything, and she should have sent Jamie to kill Ned and have Jamie be sent to the wall, or like any, like because any rational person would think as as soon as Ned has contact with with plus ned could tell god knows who else who could also tell tell robert um i need to get rid of ned she doesn't do anything she just says that line those who play the game of thrones they either they either get the throne or they die or what i can't remember the exact the exact thing so again she just randomly benefits by the stupidity of ned stark um it's consistent with his character by the way because she, she might know that right I mean, I'm, I'm apologetics for her, but basically she might know, like, Ned, like the fact that Ned came to her, that might have been all the information she needed to know that he wasn't a threat to her. The, uh, meaning that he does need to be killed, but that he wasn't an immediate threat. Because an immediate threat wouldn't have come to her. An immediate threat would have, like, got her back. But Littlefinger would have taken him out within an hour yeah you know what i mean or sure. tried to discredit him she doesn't do anything you know she doesn't start spreading rumors or you know and i'm not saying that cersei is a terrible person i'm i'm well maybe she is she but is. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that uh, in terms of the game of thrones yeah, yeah. And, and if we look at colin's uh criteria effectiveness sure. of strategy she has a terrible strategy sure. I her, could see your her, the implementation of her power. She she has so much power. Yeah, she she could do all sorts of shit. The use of resources. She doesn't seem to be doing anything. Um, so then, uh, going on, uh, Ned figures out, and he doesn't doesn't tell Robert, and Robert dies, and then um, other people are conspiring, including Tywin, by the way, against Ned at this point. So as Queen Regent to Joffrey. She's terribly ineffective. What's the worst thing? Uh, what's the what's the best example of how ineffectual she was as the queen regent of Joffrey? Well, she she let him get killed. <laughs> let, Joffrey. let Joffrey get killed. Yeah. Okay, but uh, before he dies. Um, well, first of all, she shouldn't have had them kill Ned Stark like that, right? Because that made him a martyr, right? Yeah. Well, that starts the War of the Five Kings. Yeah, which was very costly and nearly, you know, uh, Rob Stark was poised to win if he didn't yeah. marry Jane Westerling. Yeah. Uh, a lot of what ifs, but yeah. a lot of people agree that if Rob Stark had, had not pissed off the phrase, yeah. uh, then Rob Stark would have rolled into King's Landing. Yeah. Um, so again, there's a lot of what ifs, you know, you get Stannis and blah, blah, blah. And of course you got Daenerys eventually, but, um, but she, and so to your point, you're right, because she is more scared of her secrets seeing the light of day. Well, she's so also she, not seemingly doing anything to shore up power. Uh, Joffrey yeah. is a known wild card, yeah. and she has talked with Joffrey. The agreement as they're going up to the public display is that Joffrey's going to send Ned to the wall. Yeah. And she had to have known that Joffrey might take matters into his own his own hands. She she doesn't do anything to make sure, Joffrey make sure wall, yeah. okay, don't don't do it. And she doesn't do anything to prepare that relationship for right. her to be able to yeah, get control of it. She's not being him. effective, you're right. Yeah. And um everything could have been over uh because she's queen regent because she can control the king, but she cannot control the king, so right. she's basically powerless. Yeah. Okay. So then um going on here uh she managed to win the war against Tyrion. <laughs> uh but again she's just lucky with that by the end of season four well they get that isn't that when they get the green fire uh no i'm talking about uh later on when Tyrion is implicated in the death of joffrey oh. so uh she hates she hates Tyrion, yeah. and uh, if she used her power effectively, sh she would get rid of Tyrion or kill him. And by the end of season four, Tyrion is uh, across the narrow sea. He is suicidal. He has no power. Um, he'll soon be dead or a bounty hunter will catch him. You know, yeah. So 
in terms of circumstances, she's won her battle against Tyrion. Yes. But if you look at how that happened, she almost had nothing to do with it. Of course, she didn't kill Joffrey. Olena killed Joffrey, and Littlefinger killed Joffrey, but mainly Olena. Tyrion just happened to be holding Joffrey's cup, yeah. uh, which was very random. If if Tyrion hadn't been holding Joffrey's cup, Joffrey would have died right there, and no one would have. Or I guess maybe they would think Tyrion. They would have still because he was nearby, yeah. but there wouldn't be any direct evidence. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and so, uh, if she were playing the Game of Thrones, what she should have done with Tyrion is what? Like during the whole storyline, what should she have done? Well, okay, giving her all the knowledge that we have. Um, no, no, only the knowledge up till those those points. We, you know, well, no special but knowledge. But that's where I'm, because from her perspective and from everyone's perspective, Tyrion had no power. But Tyrion was very smart. We know that. No, everyone knew that, including Tywin, which is why yeah, Tywin yeah. made him hand sure, of the king. Sure. If she were playing the Game of Thrones, she would have at least a working relationship with her brother, who was yeah. hand of the king for a while. Tyrion, in the beginning of the storyline, was a Lannister through and through. And although there was a streak of opposition in him or some yeah. goodness, in the books, he's not good like he is in the show. But he's a Lannister, and he could be used to her advantage and could have, you know, he, he would have been putty in her hand because he was so desperate for his older sister's love and attention. If he, if she just gave a little bit to him, he would at the very least wouldn't have been against her and at best could have been a huge ally. Yeah. No, you're not wrong. I just, it's kind of hard because they, you're right. They thought he was smart, but they also considered him such a bit player, you know? Tywin didn't, he made him, he made him hand of the king. That's, but he still didn't respect them. (laughs) You know, it's like... But he clearly saw that that yeah. Tyrion had some again, especially when Tyrion became Hand of the King. Yeah. If you're playing the Game of Thrones, like when Ned arrives in King's Landing, uh, Littlefinger hates Ned with a passion, at the very least because Ned took Catelyn from him. Yeah, and Ned, uh, I think it was Ned, or maybe it was Ned's older brother, humiliated Peter, like Peter Baelish. I believe challenges either Ned or the older brother to a duel, which is to the death, I think, typically. And Ned or the older brother don't even take it seriously. They like defeat Peter and they don't even kill him. They just like push him. That's like, come on, Peter, like knock it off. And it's like utterly humiliating to, 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 to Baelish. He hates Ned, but when Ned arrives in town, he ingratiates himself. That's, playing the game of thrones my friend i mean you're not wrong so, so again i'll say over and over you're not wrong she's definitely not thinking many moves ahead i'm i'm at the same time also looking at it from her perspective the moves she you know maybe this is the biggest problem and maybe this is why you're right that she's not a good player of the game of thrones but it's because two two factors conspiring against her one that she was already in the throne and yeah. when you're in the throne you start getting lazy and complacent Number one. Number two, that she wasn't in the throne because she was a woman and she had no power. And so, like, these two factors end up making it so she is, you're right, very ineffectual. But the, 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 the part that I'm remembering comes later when she actually starts being more ruthless and more yeah. you know conniving and blah blah blah. When we get to Danny, yeah. yeah. That's a woman. Yeah. Uh she is very effective, but yeah. when we look at post season 4, yeah, which is potentially not canon, but yeah, yeah when she blows up all yeah. you know, 90% <laughs> of the nobility of King's Landing yeah. in one fell swoop, she gets rid of <laughs> she gets rid of Marjorie she gets rid of the sparrow. Yeah, she gets rid of uh, you know countless others. So I think that's what's working against me is I'm thinking of the wrong time frame here, because in the first four seasons, like you're describing, the more we go over it, you're right. She isn't planning very well, which kind of points to the possibility that the later things will not be canon. Because Could if be. it's one thing that George R. R. Martin, as mm-hmm. we can tell uh, by that, was another thing that I gleaned, and I'm not going to get to all my notes because yeah. we don't have time, but. <laughs> I, I was I was marveling at how consistent you know these story beats are. Mm. Um, you don't see Cersei 
out of nowhere have this genius move. Sure. Because she's never had ge- a genius move. She's a privileged mm. p- person who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. And a lot of famous people are like that, and a yeah. lot of medieval players were sure. like that. You know what I mean? Fair enough. Um, so at the end of season four, where is her power? Do you, so Tommen is on the throne. Right. Marjorie is betrothed to Tommen. How much power does Cersei have at that point? Well, she, on the one hand, she's got an immense power in paper, but she is, she's very, that power is very threatened because uh, her son will be controlled, not by her, <laughs> and she ultimately isn't the king. Right. Yeah. Tommen will be controlled by... By, what's her name? Mar- by, by Marjorie. Marjorie. And yeah. Marjorie is not controlled, by, but... Steered by... Olena. Olena. So... Yeah. And Olena is essentially in charge of House Tyrell. And Olena is like a billion times craftier than Cersei. And ru- yeah. and, and also yeah. ruthless. ruthless. Uh, or pragmatic at the very least. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she yeah. kills Joffrey. Yeah. <laughs> she poisons his... Yeah. She personally poisoned Joffrey's cup yeah. and did it with grace and style, yeah. <laughs> with like without any kind of fear, right? Um, so, yeah, at this point, and we see the scenes at the end of season four where... Tommen is sitting on the throne and given googly eyes to Marjorie in the mm-hmm. wings, and the Queen Regent Cersei is looking at her son, going, "He's making googly eyes at someone. Who is that?" Yeah. Looks up, sees Marjorie, goes over there, and they have a talk. And Marjorie holds her own. Yeah, and uh, you know we don't know what would happen in the books. Maybe Cersei kills Marjorie, but that wouldn't solve the problem because Tommen has to marry somebody. Wait, so. Everything after season four is not in the books, or or something. Uh, is it season four? Um, I'm forgetting. When does John get stabbed? I don't know. Is that the end of season four? Because everything after John, John gets stabbed at the end of the last, the last book. book. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The ma- majority of the story beats, honestly, of the big story beats, are are not in the books. Okay. It's kind of weird to think about, <laughs> um, which is another reason why I didn't hate the showrunners that much because I'm like, if if you entertain all the, and you go at this pace, y- this show will go on for another 50 seasons. You know, anyway, they could have gone on two more seasons. I've been watching also a lot of breakdowns of how those guys fucked that up. Because they did a, a really good job adapting the books, right. and season, f- f- you know, the the seasons that followed the, you know, the that they were just making it up. Yeah. Um, some of those seasons and episodes were pretty good. So what happened in the last couple seasons? It's just if you're gonna put an exhaust port where if you shoot the bullets just the right place, it blows up the whole Death Star. At least make the lead up to that super suspenseful and like the climax of the whole thing. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, so I've I've watched all these breakdowns, and the only answer that seems to have any evidence and makes sense is that the two guys had bigger fish to fry. Yes. They wanted to make the Star Wars yes, yes, like trilogy. Exactly I think they were being offered the trilogy yeah. or something, and they were onward and upward. And they, uh, even though they loved Game of Thrones and it yeah. was their baby, they they were instrumental in even getting it off the ground in the first and place. Look, and I think through season six, even though that's past probably what was in the books, it was still good. Yeah, there were still there were some problems, but it was and it there was, were things in season seven that I liked, even a few things in season eight. But it, it's just that yes, they dialed the pace up unnaturally. Right. So uh, George Martin has said in interviews that he was suggesting that there be two more seasons beyond mm-hmm. that. Not beyond season eight as the way it was, but they're like, let's not try to cram right. everything into eight episodes of season right. of season eight or yeah. whatever, how many episodes it was. Let's let's let it breathe a little yeah. longer. And those guys were like, no. No, we gotta go. <laughs> so the only, only yeah. the only answer to that is that they had bigger gigs and they were tired of working on Game of Thrones. They just, they just you know, it's like asking the Rolling Stones to play Satisfaction for the 50 million times. <laughs> and they do it. Eventually, do it. <laughs> but, you know, there's probably some nights when they would rather not. You know what I mean? So anyway, so then Tywin was planning on marrying Cersei to who? Do you remember who? Tywin was Tywin was planning to marry Cersei to the guy from uh, the, the, the sailor people. No, nope. no. Nope. Wasn't that the no nope. the guy who was the 
No. That happens later then? That's you're you're thinking of what's his name? He's the he's the He, he was also very poorly represented the, of the show. Kind of pirate type guy. Yeah, yeah. Pike from Pike. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, okay, so no, I forget who. Loris Terrell, the the Knight of Flowers, I believe he is. Oh, okay. He was Renly Baratheon's lover. Remember? Yeah, him? now anyway, I remember. Yes, yeah, uh, now I remember. Because yeah. Tywin's like that guy was a badass fighter. Yeah, very, very. Uh, uh, in the show, he's a good fighter, but in the yeah. books, he's very good. Yeah. yeah. And Tywin, of course, is thinking, well, let's shore up our allegiance yep. and alliance with the Tyrells. Um, you know, we don't have Tyrion. We're not going to uh, do well with that. You now are a widow, so let's marry you to, to Loras. And if the random event of Jamie letting Tyrion out and the random event of Tyrion managing to sneak up on a unsuspecting Tywin while he's on the shitter and the uns- and the unforeseen event that Tyrion kills Tywin, mm-hmm. if that hadn't happened, then Cersei would have been married to Loras Ty- right. T- Tyrell, right. who isn't even the heir to the to House Tyrell. Right. He's like a second son so she would just be a random wife right. to a random Terrell, right. <laughs> just a knight, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so her stock was going down. <laughs> so it, it, and and uh, uh, it, she should have been able to predict that. She should yeah. have been able to say, my dad's probably going to do, I need to prepare. She, she was not playing that game. Yeah. Um, so my overall grade for her is a D. She did some okay. things well, but she... Uh, 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 You've convinced me. It's in spite of her that she managed to even be where she was by the end of season four. Now, of course, beyond that, you've convinced me. And and like I said, I I think my memories are tainted from what happens after that. All right. So let's look at Danny. Okay. Another woman, but she starts off with some clout as a Targaryen, but then loses all of it immediately, right? Like, right. Basically, nearly gets killed and. Then is banished and then... right. She's across the narrow sea, and her older brother Viserys is the heir. Uh, apparently, there are others. By the way, there's like an there's like an Aegon somewhere <laughs> in the books. But <laughs> but um, she's just like Cersei. She's just a marryable family member for Viserys's right. purposes, and that's what happens. She gets married off to Cal Drogo. She doesn't want to marry Cal Drogo. Right. He's the last person that she. But anyway. So she starts off as basically uh, her older brother is a, a very unlikely powerful person yeah. <laughs> because he's got a raise an army, da, da, da. But, you know, he's got the name. They don't have dragons. There's no dragons anywhere. So when she's married to Khal Drogo, she plays the Game of Thrones well yeah. by getting Khal Drogo to respect her. Mm-hmm. At first, she's just a trophy wife kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, a plaything, some something to parade around and like, look, it's a you know a Targaryen or a a, a white haired, silver haired wife, da da. Um, but he, she actually manages to get Khal Drogo to not only like interact with her instead of just have sex with her, but also like respect her. And she also managed to get get the Dothraki to respect mm-hmm. her, which is a huge feat. That's she's right. She's a small. She in the book, she's like thirteen. She's a very small person, and. She manages to get the Dothraki to respect her in spite of Viserys. Then, you know, Khal Drogo dies, and there's a lot of things that she manages to accomplish in this time. She throws herself in the pyre. She emerges from the fire with three uh, hatched dragon eggs, and so she now has three dragons. Then she eventually trades for the slave army, the Unsullied, and she basically doesn't even have to lose anything in the transition <laughs> because the 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 dragon uh, kills the slave owner. And she starts inspiring the the slaves and inspiring people. And, right. Yeah. Uh, 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 you know, Littlefinger couldn't do that. Right. She manages to inspire and free thousands of slaves mm-hmm. across various different regions, and they all completely love her now. Yeah, to the point that. She she's got armies w- willing to die, uh, you know, with a snap of a finger. Yeah, in a very short amount of time. Yeah, she has dragons. You can say the dragons might be a little random, but uh, the dragons have not a lot to do. They have something to do, but they don't have yeah. a lot to do with the fact that she now uh, eventually becomes queen. Yeah, in in marine. 
Well, if it were just the dragons, she would get killed pretty quickly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, but a lot of what she does doesn't have anything to do with the dragons. No, that's what I mean. If it were, if her power was just because of the dragons, oh. they would have just offed her. Like, yeah. ooh, she's got too much power. Those dragons, got to kill her. Absolutely. Instead, they respect her. They want to follow her. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And she plays a lot of different games, a lot yes. of different moves with the second sons, you know, yes. the, the mercenaries. And the different slave owners and the and the the key players, the the sort of dukes and duchesses of each area, if you will. This is Golden and Age Daenerys, the Daenerys we all grew up with and love. She incites <laughs> a slave revolt within a city. Yes. To overthrow it, um, which is huge. I mean, like think about it, right? Yeah. A whole society, <laughs> like yeah. Show them. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> in essence, I mean, it's not the Iron Throne, but she. If she wanted to, she could have just sat back and said, I am one of the most powerful people yeah. in that's ever lived. She owns the whole East or whatever that and is. And I'm worshipped <laughs> and yeah. I have like undying loyalty from these people. Yeah. I can't lose, but I'm a Targaryen, so I have to go to Westeros. Um, and uh, let's see. She also has excellent advisors and is smart about those advisors. Right. Ser Jorah... Uh, Masande, Grey Worm, Barrett, Sir Which, By the way, you could see that as the tragedy of her character. And I'm not talking about what they do with her towards the end of the series. I'm just talking about how you're right that she's ascended from... She was... Technically, she had the world, or at least part of it. She was still a woman, but she had a lot of the world. Then she lost all of it. But she ascended to, from that to essentially having most of the unknown world, you know, the rest of the world, let's say, right? But she has this baggage that in her mind that's not good enough she needs to be a targaryen she needs to go back to the other thing right and that's the tragedy of that yeah yeah and at the time of the end of season four she has all the time in the world she's young she has all the time in the world to build up an army mm -hmm. get ships get you know more money mm -hmm. um now in the show we're like Come on, Danny, get back to Westeros. But you know, yeah. she could have waited twenty years. Yeah, she could. And <laughs> um, you know, uh, got more spies and actually figure out a way to have better built, ships. You know? Yeah, built armies and ships and. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, you know, she was uh, she played a part. I should mention this in killing Viserys. She didn't kill him directly, but she didn't stand in Cal Drogo's way, and she also defied Varys a number of times up until that point, which I don't think she was scheming to provoke him so that he would make a fool out of himself so that Khal Drogo would kill him. But she had to uh, make those choices. Yeah. And um, she played at least the game of being yeah. a good person plus a good power person in that as the Khaleesi, she yeah. was very respected based on those decisions that she was making, which led to a, a very easy choice for the community and Khal Drogo to do to, to take That's out right. Viserys, which makes her the next in line to, to the Iron Throne. Um, also, uh, she's given this, she doesn't fight for it, but she has the name of Targaryen. And if it's one thing of watching House of the Dragon, which I love, is you really get a sense for how the people of Westeros feel about Targaryens. Mm. Because, you know, when we meet Game of Thrones, the Targaryens are in the past. Right. And they're, they're, remember when Viserys and even Danny would say, like, we are, we deserve to be in the Iron Throne. Right. And the whole time you're just like, why? why? <laughs> like, w w w why is it your right, right, you know? And Viserys would talk about, all I have to do is show up on Westeros and uh, the banners will come. Yeah. And you're thinking, why would they do that just for a kid and you're like yeah. not a good you have you, you don't have any skills or anything to offer but when you watch house of the dragon you know and the way it was in medieval history you are transcendent as being of that bloodline plus as a targaryen there is there are reasons to believe that you might actually be transcendent of sure. human because you uh, there's rumors and possibilities that you actually bred with dragons and that right. you descend from certain things. And, and so there's a, a, a real specialness around. So Danny has that. So uh, after watching House of the Dragon, I think in George R. R. Martin's universe, when Danny lands, I think there's a good possibility that a number of lords would just run to her 
even if she didn't have any armies. Sure. Especially when you think about all the shit they've been through yeah. with these other kings, <laughs> you know? And Robert wasn't super respected a, yeah. as, a, as a king. So um, anyway, so the grade I give for Danny is A plus as well. Absolutely. Up until that point, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So just briefly, my number three is Olena. She started with a lot of power, but she manages to kill Joffrey so that Marjorie would have a yeah. more pliable king, which gives Marjorie more power and Olena more power. Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's all true. I just, I think it's one of those, like, you got to stack up the accomplishments, you know? Well, yeah. the fact that she managed to kill Joffrey in front of everyone and get Tyrion blamed for it <laughs> and not be implicated, and yeah. she manages Littlefinger, too. Like, that's a feat, because Littlefinger could have turned on her and, yeah. and, and managed to turn her in. So she, she does something like that. She also you know, manages to have a lot of moves with Varys and other people. You know, it's it's one thing. Um, yeah, maybe I just like Olena. <laughs> well, she's a very good character, and she you're right. She steered that masterfully. Yeah. It's just, like, I, when I compare it to Littlefinger, who spent, you know, decades right. carefully, like, finagling Well, that's why, that's why Littlefinger and Danny is, is are higher. really in a class of yeah, their yeah. own. Also, there's evidence that Olena has been dealing with what she considers to be her idiot son, Mace. She's been uh, mm. managing Mace uh, for maybe years and years, and maybe right. there's a lot of moves that she's had to make in order to make sure that Mace, although has authority, she has the real power. Mm. Mace doesn't try to conflict with... Do we see him in the show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, what, who is he? Okay. Uh, he, he? He's around, and, okay. and he doesn't have a lot of lines. Okay. He's a doofus. Okay. You, you, you would just remember him as being a yeah. real doofus. <laughs> um, Marjorie, she makes a number of moves, but it's hard it's to know. It's limited. It's, but it's also potentially just a matter of circumstance, yeah. because it would make sense that she would marry upward or be in the role of, of a queen role because you have to get the alliance with the Tyrells because they have all the money and yeah. power and the army. And I mean, it, it, controlling the younger kids sexually is definitely something calculated, but it's not the, the most impressive feat of all time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, right. So anyway, the, the grade that I'll give Elena is a B, but I might kind of degrade that a little bit. But, you know, you could say by doing not bad things and just biding your time until you have the yeah. moment to strike the way Elena did. strike she did, and it was, like you said, it, it, it was an incredible feat she pulled off. Right, and it completely turned things around. Turned things around. So like, you got to give her a lot of bonus points. Right, <laughs> uh, and she waited for the right moment yeah. or something. I don't know. Um, Marjorie, I'm going to give a D, not because Marjorie No, is, she just didn't have bad, a chance to do it enough. But yeah. she's kind of a victim of circumstance. Yeah. And uh, but she does make uh, make moves. Um, so uh, I could go into detail about Tywin, but he's dead. I could yeah. go into detail about Tyrion, who made a lot of really awesome moves, sure, um, and was punching way above yeah, yeah. his his weight. But at this point, he's uh, completely powerless, and arguably could have got out ahead of that situation by not being not giving in to his emotions about Joffrey. Right. Now, we love it. We love when Tyrion slaps Joffrey totally. and all that stuff. But if he was really playing the Game of Thrones, he, have, yes. he would have <laughs> kissed Joffrey's ass a little bit and maybe kissed uh, Cersei's ass a little bit too, yeah. you know? But he had integrity. <laughs> um, what about, um, uh, you know, the uh, Robert's brother, is it? the uh, John... Jon Snow or? No, 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 no. Oh, Stannis? Stannis. Yeah, so Stannis, I could go into detail as well. And he's benefited by circumstance, like Renly was murdered. Well, I guess you could argue that St that Stannis managed to befriend the priestess of the Lord of Light. Yeah. And, and I mean, he... M Melisande. And, and she ends up killing Renly. Yeah. So and he starts... I mean, he's got this whole campaign going on the side that could really bear fruit eventually yeah and he know? does manage to get an army together and he 
His downfall though is the same. That the the red witch, right? Isn't that her name? Yeah. Because well, her name is Melisande. Melisande. But, because that's what starts. He goes so far that he loses the respect of even his right hand man because he burns his daughter. Like right. You know, it's just uh, a little too the, far. The Onion Knight. We're playing a little too much of the Game of Thrones. Yeah. Um, and then you could talk about uh, Jon Snow. He rose pretty high. He by the end of season four, he's commander of the Night Watch. It must be actually before. I, in my notes, I don't have him. He stabbed knows nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, he he's done. He did really well at the wall. There were a lot of things that he could have done wrong that would have landed him either dead or would have landed him as just a secondary character to the wall. You know, you're, you're right. I just, no, I don't see him as playing the game of Thrones. I see him as more like playing the game of surviving. <laughs> right. So these next, this next group of people yeah. would never think they're playing for the iron. Yeah, Tone. Yeah, yeah. But like Braun, for example, he has played at least the game of power very, very well. Yeah. And I won't go into detail on that, but, but uh, he, he uh, was potentially, lower than anybody and by the end of season four he's poised to be a minor yeah. no, a minor noble ramsey has also ramsey. played the game yeah. and uh, he's done pretty well a, a bastard yeah. kid he's now a bolton very powerful he's in line to be warden of the north um aria you could argue has uh, at least survived you know and, yeah. and she's played the game really well there's a lot of things she does before leaving westeros that uh, were directly her choices to lead to her. But it's um, definitely not a Game of Thrones. It's a game of revenge. <laughs> right. Yeah, just in survival. Yeah. Um, we could go into Varys and Catelyn Stark as well, but anyway. All right, final word on that yammering of, of nerddom. Fascinating. You know what? It makes me want to watch the whole series again. I know. And I definitely need to catch up on uh, House of the Dragon seasons seven and eight. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It, it, House of the Dragon. So... Uh, at this point, it's uh, episode seven. I think just aired. Oh, are they not? They're releasing one at a time. Yeah. Ooh, fun. Just just aired a couple nights ago, and I haven't watched it yet. The thing about House of Dragon that I think it suffers from is there's no Tyrion mm. or a Brienne of Tarth or Jamie. There's no character that you you connect with really okay. it's it's more of like a recreation you, you kind of connect it's like with a, a historical couple, drama or yeah <laughs> like a historical drama um which is a, a bit of a downgrade but yeah but what it makes up for is in its believability and the writing and the character arcs and the design and the dialogue it's 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 very very well made and mm. and i love it and um it also has those major story beats, you know? Yeah. That was the big thing about Game of Thrones, where at the water cooler, everyone would be like, oh my God, oh my God, that thing that happened. Yes. And uh, season two starts to have that. There starts to be like these right. moments where you're like, I was watching uh, episode four, something happens, a couple okay. things happen, and I'm watching it, and I'm you're just like, like oh, sh heck? oh, <laughs> shit, oh, shit. Okay, I want to watch it. I, I Like I told you before, the first five episodes of the first season, I I thought were amazing. And then the only thing that bugged me is the, the time speed up really threw me for a loop. I didn't like the change of actors. Yeah. And then... And then the only other big complaint is I felt that they that the character of the uncle I always forget his name Otto Hightower. He oh no you're Damon no, Damon Targaryen. Damon Damon he his character wavered like it started off one way then in the middle section it changed and then it kind of went back to the old yeah and, and but 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 there was so much good so I'm definitely excited to see season two. All right, well that does it for that episode of Psychology in Seattle. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it. 